Hi, I'm Jill Fry and I'm an avid Aurora hunter. I have been lucky enough to see the Aurora Australis many times from my front gate and I've also been lucky enough to travel to Scandinavia and Canada to see Aurora Borealis. They are two completely different things and completely different experiences. So this video is particularly on Aurora Australis. You want to know where to go, what you're going to see and how do you capture it in camera. Aurora Australis can be seen in Tasmania, Victoria, New Zealand and the southern states of Australia. But it has also been seen as far north as Canberra. But that was a really big event. So what actually is Aurora Australis? Well, first of all, sit back, relax, and have a look at the amazing images of the Aurora. Okay, so you've seen the footage and you want to see it because it's just amazing, isn't it? So what actually is an aurora? An aurora is caused by the sun. All the time there are sun flares going off at the sun. It is an exploding mass. And every now and again, when a flare is released, it is earth directed. It is this flare that three days later after leaving the sun arrives at Earth and it excites the charged particles around the North and South Pole. In the North, those charged particles or the aurora is called Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights. And in the South, it's Aurora Australis. This solar wind excites the particles at the poles, causing them to light up. And that's why we see these amazing, dis magical displays of colour. Now, I'm not going to go into all the science about it because there's other videos that will give you all in the nth degree. You just want to see it. You just want to capture it. So... I'll tell you how to do it. The first thing is to try and get a clear view south. You need to get away from city lights. So try and head out along the coast or east or west of your major town and look south. If you don't know which way is south, if you know some of the stars in the Southern Cross, look for the Southern Cross. There are also apps that you can get on your phone, even Google Maps, to show you which way south is. So use that so you've got a fair indication you're looking the right direction. 
So what does it look like in reality? You're there looking to the south and you go, well, I'm not seeing all these amazing colours in the sky. The thing is, you can't. What you will see is a muted colour version of what you see in the camera. You've got to remember that the camera is open for a long period of time to be able to capture all those amazing colours that are happening in the sky. So what you will probably be seeing is an air glow, a glow happening. So have a look at this image. This is more or less what you'll actually see with your eye. It's in camera that the magic happens. When you're going out aurora chasing, one thing that's really important is that you actually dress warm. It gets really, really cold at night, much more than you would expect. And there's nothing worse than being outside, waiting for an aurora to happen, and you're starting to freeze. So I always make sure I have merino thermals, my jumper, my jacket, my woolly hat, my scarf, my gloves, and if I need them, they are there to put on. Also, woolen socks, much better. And try not to have cotton against your skin. It tends to make it a little bit cooler. Wool is actually best. So although that might sound a little bit silly, it's not a fashion show. You want to be warm, you want to be comfortable, so you can enjoy the experience. Okay, so I've told you what to wear. Now what camera gear do you need to take? You need to take a tripod, your camera, and preferably a lens that is more wider, such as 24, something like that. This is to ensure that you can capture as much of the aurora as possible. Check out my YouTube video on how to take shots at night. So it will tell you what equipment you need, how to get the shot, and how to focus. It's especially important you know how to focus at night and try and practice during the daytime because when you get out there at night and you can't see and can't figure out where your settings are on the camera, that's where it all becomes not as much fun. So make sure you're familiar with your camera, you have your settings already set up in your camera and you're ready to go. Now, just a little word on photographer's etiquette. Quite often when there's an Aurora event happening, there's a lot of photographers wanting to capture the event. So one of the things that I really strongly put in my classes is that everyone wants to get the shot. So just be aware of the other photographers and where they're situated. So don't go walking to the front so that you're in their shot. Try and stay in a line if you can. The other thing that can be particularly annoying for other photographers is if you are flashing around lights. Now there was something going around on Facebook saying, oh the red light's okay, you can't see that. Well I'm here to tell you, yes you can. And that red light will be affecting the other photographer's shots. So please just be considerate of other photographers who are also trying to capture that magic moment. So how do you know when Aurora is going to happen? First of all, I suggest you sign up to some of the Facebook pages. There's usually a bit of chatter on the pages if something is looking imminent. But then what I do is I go to www.aurora-service.net slash aurora-forecast. I'll put that link in the comments below. This is the page where you really know if something is going to happen or not. Now the first thing that I look at are the gauges. And the gauges are a BZ gauge, a speed gauge and a density gauge. 
there is colour coding on these gauges. The more red on the dial means the more possibility of a bigger aurora. So have a look to see where that dial is. For the BZ, it has to be negative to be able to see an aurora. So you'll see on that dial, it needs to be in the orange or red. For the speed dial, the more speed, the better. You'll see it starts off at 200 in the green and goes round 400 in the yellow, 500 for orange and 700 for red. So the more the gauge is going round towards the red, the better. The next thing is the density. Obviously, the better the density, the better you're going to be able to see the aurora. So when it's in the green, you may see it, but it won't be very strong. When it gets to the yellow, it's getting better. When it gets the orange and red, yep, that's what you want. The other thing I look at is the ovation oval. It's a map which shows the ring around the south pole of the aurora. I would suggest you look at this fairly often just to see the difference. When there's a thin green line, not much is going to be happening. When it gets thicker, it's looking a bit more like it's got a bit of potential. If there's yellow or orange or better still red appearing in that ovation oval, it looks like you're gonna get a good show. The other thing that I like to look at is called the GOES graph, G-O-E-S graph. Generally, when the GOES graph starts to dive, it starts to get a bit more interesting. If it goes down below 50, there's definitely a possibility of an aurora. I use this graph to help predict when to go out because I can actually see the aurora from my front gate. When it has dived below 50 and starts to ping back up again, I know that within 20 minutes to half an hour, there will be more chance of seeing an aurora. But really, you only really know an aurora is there when you see it or someone else sees it. And that's where the Facebook alert pages are great because as soon as somebody sees an aurora, they post it up on the alert pages and you get out there as fast as you can. So how long does an aurora last? Sometimes it can only last minutes. Sometimes it will go on for hours. But you really don't know until you get there and you see it. So don't dally if something's happening because it might not last long. So what about the moon? Is that gonna affect the aurora? Well, yes, it does. But it's also gonna depend on how strong the aurora is and how strong the moon is. I have captured an aurora at full moon but the aurora was very strong. So just because it's a full moon, if there's a potential for a big aurora, still go out. There's still an opportunity to catch something special. A couple of other apps that are useful to you is going to know whether it's going to be cloudy or not. If it's cloudy, you've got much less chance of seeing the aurora. So the two apps I usually use are Clear Outside and also yr.no, which is a Norwegian website, but I find it to be quite accurate. I'll pop the links down below so you can click on them and have a look to see what your weather is going to be like in your area. Another question I often get asked is there a better time of year to see the aurora? 
The aurora can happen any time of the year, but seems to be most active around the equinoxes in March and September. So what camera settings are you going to need? I generally have a start off camera settings. So put your ISO at 1600, your time at 20 seconds, and your f-stop as low as it will go. So if you can go to 2.8, 2.4, fantastic. If you only have f4, that's fine. Also, you don't have to have a professional full-frame camera to capture the aurora. You can use a cropped DSLR. I have captured the aurora on a 700D and I've captured it on a 6D and a 6D too. So it really doesn't matter. One thing about your camera settings, and I suggest you actually put them on your camera before it's dark so they're set and ready to go. But when you get out there in the field and you have put your camera on your tripod, making sure that any image stabilisation on your lens is turned off and you're on manual focus and you can then focus on infinity. If it is a very big aurora, you'll find these settings too bright and you'll need to dial it down. You can dial down your ISO or you can lessen the time. What I find is if there are beams happening, you want to lessen the time and that is because then you get structure of the beams. If you imagine that your camera is open for 20 seconds and you've got all these beams happening, then you're less likely to capture that structure. If you're able to reduce the time so you get a little bit of movement, then you'll get the beams. Make sure in camera that you have got noise reduction turned off. If noise reduction is on, then what you'll find is the camera will take the time to take the shot and then it will take the same time to do the noise reduction in camera. Thanks for watching and if you'd like to see more information and tips on photography then please do subscribe to my channel and I'll see you next time. Bye!